Steven Seagal has shown some incredible and some questionable techniques in the first episode of his meeting with karate expert Jesse Enkan. Now it's time to look at what Steven Seagal taught Jesse in the second episode. When we do this kind of thing, you can even do this. Yeah, the trapping of the hands is pretty cool. At the same time, I know a lot of people are skeptical about trapping hands in a real fight because it's such a small moment in between grappling range and striking range. But from what I know, some UFC fighters are using it, and I think it's possible to trap the hands at least for a tiny moment to get a strike in there. I'm just not sure if somebody would be standing there with their hands trapped and they wouldn't do anything about it. Look at the hand again, look at the feet again. There you go, we have another time of stepping on the foot, which a lot of the viewers established that, yeah, it's a legit strategy. Now, in my style, I would just take this and go into... Mm. Yeah you know, something like that, right. but you can't do that. So now Stan Seagal is going into manipulating the fingers, which I did practice myself a little bit in Aikido, but in many Aikido styles, you don't practice that. I know Steven Seagal taught it a lot, but interesting thing I do know is that Lenny Sly, a well-known Aikido expert who has his YouTube channel, he used to work as a bouncer. He told me that manipulating fingers of various people, that it worked out for him brilliantly in bar fight situations. This is being trapped. You have a certain type of footwork to achieve this? So that's a great question from Oliver, because as a professional fighter, he realizes that trapping the hands itself is just a small part of the picture. The real question is how you get in there safely without someone shooting for your legs or punching you as you go in to trap the arms yourself. Oftentimes achieving the technique can be easier than getting into the position to do it. In Two. my footwork, it's always like a triangle. So what Steven's showing here is a more or less a traditional Aikido stance, which is said to be adopted from a sword stance. And I'm always sliding. Right. Uh, I don't do this thing that you guys are doing. Right. Jumping I, I around. Don't... But the sliding of the foot, there's a couple of problems they have about that. Again, it's a traditional way that apparently the samurai used to use of sliding feet versus lifting the feet. But one, I learned the hard way that it's actually not very good for your knees because as you're sliding the feet, there's friction and tension which goes into your knees and potentially even the hips. And the other thing, you have to take into account the surface that you're fighting on. If it's a dojo, if it's gym, yeah, you're gonna have a tatami where you're gonna slide through, but if you're in a field where there are a bunch of rocks and holes, if you're sliding the feet, you may bump your feet into many different things. So I'm warning if lifting the feet is not actually more practical. I will just stand here. Mm. Mm. Stand here, stand here. In your style, you're gonna move. Right. As you're moving, don't jump around a lot. Don't do this stuff. Right. If you move, just move like this. And from here, take your, take your shot. So the reason behind people bouncing around and moving all the time, especially in professional fights, is to be able to react and respond. You're always keeping on your toes so that you could jump back, jump forward, and that actually helps. You'd be sliding the feet and moving like Steven Seagal does here. I have a bit of a question if that helps you respond quick enough. For example, leg kicks or takedowns or strikes. But again, we'd have to see that in sparring, if that really works out for him or not. Meanwhile, in a self-defense situation, to just stand there in a neutral but ready stance which we established in the previous episode that is effective, that does make sense because you're more unpredictable. The person is not seeing you coming from here and striking versus if you're moving around, that can actually telegraph to their person that you have intention to fight and make it easier for them to defend. Okay. Yep. This is sword. Uh, same idea. Kick. Yeah. This is sword. Yep. Yeah. So that's a technique which I just actually analyzed in my breakdown of Steven Seagal's fight scenes. And as I said there, it seemed like a legit technique. My question though is, are you really gonna be able to catch that leg this way? Because notice that first Seagal is blocking the leg and only then he's wrapping his arm around it. But a front kick is usually fast. You're just snapping your kick in and out. When it's done slowly, yeah, sure, you can wrap your arms all day long. But if somebody's really snapping towards you and bringing their leg as fast as possible, will you really be able to catch it like that? There's a bit of a question for me. But the takedown itself, yeah, sure, it makes sense. And that's where you see a general problem with Aikido Ukes. They're conditioned to leave stuff out there. Such as in this case, there's a kick and notice at the end, he's not pulling it back. He leaves the leg out there so that Jesse could complete the technique. And yeah, I guess when you're learning a technique, it does make kind of sense to give that opportunity for the other person to try. But generally in Aikido, that's how attacks always stay the same. Either the hand is left out there or the leg is left out there and the level of difficulty from the attacker is barely ever raised. You're way too late, Oliver. Now the technique that Jesse and Oliver are doing is a different one than we just saw Steven Seagal doing on them, but maybe Jesse just edited out the second technique that Steven Seagal showed to them. And again, I think it can be an effective takedown, although my worry is when you have both hands down, your face is completely exposed. And I know that the other person doesn't have a lot of striking power while standing on one leg, but I've actually seen with my own eyes a professional fight where one guy was holding the leg and the other one just knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's an interesting approach. A bunch of questions do rise up for me though. First of all, the leg, if somebody is a good kicker, it's a super fast leg. And first question, are you really gonna be able to catch it at the right spot at the right time and it's just flying towards you? Then the next question is, what if you miss? You're half exposed because you're striking there. And the third question, again, if it's a super hard leg kick and your fist is going directly towards it, are we sure you're not gonna collide so bad that it's gonna hurt either your knuckles or your wrist? Literally, and also a lot of people could say, oh, these are kind of the secret techniques nobody knows about and that's why nobody uses it. I generally tend to look at it the other way around. While there may be some techniques which are still not adapted to professional fighting, in the majority of cases, if something would be effective, we'd most likely be already seeing it a lot being used in a fight. Striking the leg which is kicking you, personally, I've never seen it in a fight, I've never heard about it. So that makes me question, if it's so effective, are we sure that nobody uses it because nobody knows it? Or maybe it just doesn't work. So as you come to kick, I'll turn from this much distance. The turning in is good. That's what usually taught in Muay Thai against strong roundhouse kicks. But still, hitting the leg at the right spot at the right time, I'm not sure if it's just not way too difficult. There are stupid people saying, you can never do that, this punch. I've done it a thousand times. So there you go. I guess I'm one of those stupid people. But since Igal saying he did it a thousand times, the question is under what conditions did he do it? There's no footage of Steven Seagal sparring anywhere. Every time we see him demonstrating techniques, it's against people who are helping him out. The Akira Ukes who are leaving their legs out there who are attacking in a fast but slow enough way. So yeah, I can do that a thousand times on them. But if you want to claim that it works, in my book, you should demonstrate against someone who really doesn't want you to be able to pull it off. And ideally, knows how to kick or punch themselves. I've done it a thousand times and I just did it. And there you go, he said, I just did it. Yeah, well with two guys who are being polite and kicking slowly and nicely without any intention to hurt. If you'll notice if I have my hands up and this goes to turn, it's bigger. It can get blocked easier. Personally, I'm not entirely sure about the hand being much bigger or horizontally than vertically. I mean, yes, there is a difference, but I'm a bit skeptical that the difference is big enough to make a difference. On the other hand, I guess when I'm sparring and doing kickboxing when I'm wearing a big glove, punching this way, yeah, it takes a bit more space. And sometimes I do use a vertical punch as an uppercut to get through the guard and to reach the person easier. But at the same time, from what I know, I'm also losing power because by turning your fist, the theory is that you're generating more power because you're throwing it in. And a lot of my striking coaches, they actually ask me to turn the fist even further in and not just stop horizontally to add even more power to it. So I wonder if that's not sacrificed here. You paying attention? Watch this. Okay, see, here's what's happening. It's going here and here because he's good, but it's also going into his shoulder. Right. Now watch this. Yeah. Completely different. <laughs> okay, so now I think I know what Steven Seagal is pointing at. And my main IQ instructor actually pointed out the same thing. He would ask us to turn the fist this way, and then he would ask us to turn it vertically. And because of how your shoulder aligns, when somebody's putting pressure into it, when you have the fist horizontal, a lot of the pressure goes into your shoulder when somebody's pushing you, so it's difficult to maintain it in a stance against pressure. When it's vertical, there's a better kinetic chain which is ready to take in pressure. And then my Aikido Sensei would make the point that, you see, this fist is better connected, it has a better alignment, it can take in pressure better, thus it is superior. The problem is though, that when you're striking, you're not really pushing and no one's really pushing back. It's more like a whiplash. It's a thing you're throwing out there like a rocket. And so personally, I'm not really sure if that's a fair assessment of how good a punch is based on how well it can take in pressure from a push forward. And also too, I think Steven here, he expected Jesse to collapse and not to be able to take in pressure, but Jesse has good alignment. So that demonstration kind of didn't work out and that's what he explained. If I hit him like this, there's a lot of shock. But when I hit him like this, Hmm. you can feel a different penetration. So that's where I think we see the difference because the vertical strike, as I just explained, it can take in pushing pressure better. So in a way it makes sense that it's better at pushing stuff away. And I guess if that's your goal, yeah, sure. But I think that the main goal behind punching usually is to just cause a lot of damage. And if a vertical punch would be superior to a horizontal punch or even that turned in punch, I'm pretty sure boxers would be using it by now. And yes, there is a difference between boxing and self-defense and Steven Seagal is looking more at self-defense, but still boxing is one of the highest forms of pressure testing punches. So if a vertical punch would be superior, I'm pretty sure they would be using it all the time. In Japanese, we call it a makiwara because he uses his body just like a sword. Well, I'm not a karate expert, so I cannot comment on the use of makivara. I do know a few things about knuckle conditioning. And on one end, it's a controversial subject because the top elite fighters of the world that I met, they're usually super protective of their fist. They always wrap their hands around and they wanna make sure they never hurt their hands because they want to maintain the longevity of essentially their work tools. But on the other hand, if you're in a self-defense situation, hard knuckles can come in as useful because you're not gonna be wearing gloves, you won't have them wrapped around and you may hit tough surfaces such as the forehead. So for self-defense, conditioning your knuckles does make sense. Here like that. 
this mm. in the eyes. There's actually a good video out there where in a real fight situation, a guy throws his fingers right into the eyes of the opponent and that ends the fight. So that video did convince me that, well, this technique may be effective. This would be to come here and then here. Ooh. And then here. Yeah. And this is a break. So this is a collection of a couple of Aikido techniques known as Yubidori and Sankyo. But the real thing which stands out for me here, while I do think these techniques may be effective, my concern is that it's relying on fairly small, fast moving object, which is the fingers and the hand. Granted, yeah, there was a blow to the eyes, the person may become unstabilized, and maybe that's an opportunity to grab, but still usually going for bigger pieces of the body, the whole arm or the torso or the neck, body parts which are moving less, generally is preferred and is safer because it's harder to miss. So my question is whether relying on the fingers and the hand, twisting them is all that reliable in an adrenaline impact fast-paced situation. Also, I guess most people when they fight, they have their fists, not their fingers. Very few people do karate in the street. There's a question again. If the person has fists, how will you then grab them as fingers? Take this yeah. down here and I bring yeah. this up. And the Sankyo, it can be effective. I did pull it off a couple of times in grappling situations. Again, it's super difficult to get into that spot. And it's very important that you really lift that elbow high up and then that blocks the person from spinning out of it. But as long as you're able to do that, yeah, it's viable. One time somebody pulled a knife on me and he said, Okay, now what are you gonna do? So I really hate being skeptical and my intention is to be as unbiased as possible. But one thing I'm a fan of is body language. And in basic 101 body language, whenever somebody's not telling the truth or they're not completely telling the whole picture, the subconscious tendency is to cover your face. And in many times when somebody's not saying truth or the complete truth, they either cover their mouth, scratching the nose or the face in order to subconsciously cover the lie. And it may be a coincidence. Maybe the nose was just itchy at that time, but usually there's a thing of timing. And when somebody's making a statement and if they scratch the nose at the same time and turn the head a little bit away, that is often enough a sign that the truth is not really being told. Whether that's the case here or not, I cannot say. But as soon as I saw that body language, that's the very first thing that comes to my mind. And again, it may be partial truth. Maybe something like that did happen, but in these cases, it's likely that something is not being mentioned. Understand when I punch, for example, don't do this kind of thing. When you watch a bird who's sitting there and he takes off, do you see him go like this? You don't see nothing. So this is how good punch is. Professional fighters do often speak about not telegraphing telegraphing your punches, which is a super difficult thing to do. But if you're able to not telegraph your punches, you're definitely gonna have a huge advantage. You'll hear karate masters say, karate begins with kata and ends with kata. I don't believe that and I don't agree with that. I'm actually happy Steven Seagal just said that. Kata is very much questionable. There's pretty much no proof whatsoever that it actually makes better fighters. So to focus so much on kata, there's a big chance it is a flawed approach. My teachers told me, learn waza from the master. Fight, perfect your waza. The fight part, again, I wish we'd see footage of Steven Seagal spar and fight, and not just for around people who are not really fighting him. I'm trying to spend 60, 70% giving you guys spirituality, philosophy, because the technique, even though you might be amazed or you might be interested, yeah. that's not the most important thing. In a way I can agree with that. There's only so much you need to learn about fighting in order to be able to beat an untrained attacker. Obviously, unless he has a gun or a knife. But in fighting, can become superior pretty quickly. The real takeaway then is the philosophy, is the mentality, is becoming a more disciplined and better person. And unfortunately, not all martial arts or coaches or instructors are able to achieve that effect with their students. But personally, I think, yeah, the personal development should be a big part of training martial arts. Unfortunately, I have to say that this episode brought up more doubts and questions in me than answers, unlike the first episode. But does that deny that Steven Seagal is a great martial artist? No knows a lot and is capable a lot in martial arts? I think it doesn't. Does that mean he's a good fighter? I don't think that proves that. Fighting is a different skill altogether, which has to be pressure tested and proved. And unfortunately, we simply don't have proof for that. And if you'd ask me about personality and politics, personally, I think those are just two different subjects. They don't necessarily need to be intertwined between each other because in the end, here we're looking at Steven Seagal as a martial artist. And that's it. If you want to see the breakdown of the first episode with Steven Seagal and Jesse, make sure to click on this video right here. And thank you again for watching this video. I really appreciate all your comments, all your insights, all your views and support. It means a lot to me. I'm hoping to see you again in the next video. And as always, I wish you to own your journey.